I'm absolutely excited for today's um, continuing medical education. I would like to thank Dr. Silver for allowing me the opportunity to hijack his programming to talk a little bit about maternal cardiac health. And we are in for a treat. We are so happy that Dr. Um, Boltz, Michelle D. Boltz was able to join us. She's a board certified physician in internal medicine, cardiology, and international cardiology. And she specializes in complex coronary intervention, multivessel stenting, and mechanical circulatory report support. These are things that I know nothing about. So I'm just <laughs> telling you. Um, and one um, thing that um, that Dr. Boltz is enthusiastic about is highly specialized care within this region. She has a focus in her practice on maternal cardiac care. And so we um, are very excited to talk about a little cardio obstetrics today. She's going to be providing us with some information and I'm going to be kind of asking her all the questions that I need to know the answers to as an OBGYN in a region where we see a lot of heart disease. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Volz. We really appreciate you making this happen. Well, it's my pleasure. And thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm actually off today, but I came into the office to do this because my kids are also off for winter break. And so my house is like a zoo. Um, so it, I have to admit, I got to get my Starbucks and sneak away for a couple of hours. Well, that's awesome because I had heard that you, that you were not seeing patients today. You were going to be home. And I was like, is this going to work out? I think you're going to have to reschedule, but I'm so thankful that you're, you know, took the time out of your schedule to do this today. So I want to, um, to get started with a few questions out of respect for everyone's time. And I wanna make sure we leave a little bit of time at the end to ask questions. Um, so, because we have folks from multiple disciplines on the call today, from OB to cardiology, to um, hospital medicine and emergency medicine. So we wanna talk a little bit about how all of us can help prevent maternal mortality due to cardiac disease. So first, uh, would you talk a little bit about how the maternal mortality rates have been trending up, particularly in Georgia? And then, you know, what do we need to do um, with the most current data in terms of understanding it, particularly when it comes to cardiac disease and cardiomyopathy? Um, does it shock you that, that, that cardiac disease is actually the number one killer of Georgia moms? Not at all. Um, it doesn't. And so I I'm going to share my screen with you for a moment so that I can just show you some statistics. So um, what you'll see here is maternal mortality in the United States. Okay, this is an overall capture of maternal mortality. However, it pretty accurately reflects Georgia as well. Okay. And what we see is that the maternal mortality rate has increased from 7.2 deaths per 100,000 live births in 1987 to 16.7 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2016. And it's actually continued to increase from 2016 to the current time, made worsened, of course, by the pandemic and a lot of other things that have been happening in recent years. And the data indicate that more than half of these deaths are preventable, okay? So we could take ourselves back to where we were in 1987 um, if we have the right tools and if we have the right processes in place. If you look at the pie chart, you will see, um, and I, I love the way they break this down because I, it's a little bit confusing, I think, but here we have what they call cardiovascular conditions. So cardiomyopathy, stroke, heart attack. Um, but if you look over here in the orange, hypertensive disorders, because the last time I checked, those were also cardiovascular conditions, right? So we go from this 33 and a half percent, we add another 8% to that. So now we are at 41 and a half percent cardiovascular deaths. And then we look here and up we see pulmonary embolus. Once again, another cardiovascular cause of death. And that end adds almost another 10% to our all comer bag of cardiac conditions. And so now we're over 50%. 50% of maternal mortality is cardiovascular in nature. And, you know, for a long time, cardiologists were not providing adequate support 
to obstetricians, to all of you guys to help care for these patients. Moving on, if we divide things by race and ethnicity, we can see that black patients and Native American or Alaskan Native patients have much, much higher mortality rates if you compare them to Caucasian patients or Hispanic patients or Asian patients. And so there's something that's specifically going on inside of this population. And we know that we talk about, you know, healthcare disparities and, and inequalities in care, and that certainly plays a role. Um, but not only do we have to find out why maternal mortality in this country is so abysmal, we have to find out why it's so dangerous to be brown. Wow, I think that that is very um, telling. Every time I look at this data, um, I'm always very um, interested in, in what exactly is causing that disparity. And so we definitely want to talk a little bit more about that. Now, you're board certified in, in interventional cardiology and cardiology and internal medicine, all of these board certifications. How did you actually get interested in cardio obstetrics? Like what led to the, the interest specifically in pregnancy and, and the peripartum period? So it's really, really interesting as to how I sort of fell into this. Um, but I, so I have six children went through a lot of infertility treatments, had a lot of pregnancy related complications myself. Um, of my six, one is biological, the other five were adopted. Um, and so I've always sort of had an interest in um, you know, how pregnancy works and particularly how pregnancy works for us. But about 12 years ago, I met a patient. Uh, she was a G10, P10, or excuse me, a G11, P10. Um, who came in at about 32 weeks pregnant with severe mitral stenosis. And it was, she was a young black woman. And when she was running to the bus stop to get to her job, she noticed that she was short of breath. Um, one thing sort of led to another and there was nobody to take care of her. The OBs were floundering. And I said, listen, I'll help you guys out. I don't really know what I'm doing, but we'll figure it out as we go along. And so I volunteered to, uh, to assist them and we muddled our way through the case and we got the baby out despite the severe mitral stenosis. She refused a mitral balloon valvuloplasty that was recommended. She said, nope, I'm not doing it. And um, of course, after 10 vaginal deliveries, we ended up with you know, an equipment flying C-section, skin to baby in 45 second mess. Um, but she made it out and baby made it out. And that really sparked my interest. Wow. So that that's definitely very interesting. That sounds like a trial by fire when it comes to jumping into cardio obstetrics. And one of the things you mentioned is how pregnancy works. And that's one thing I was hoping that you could talk to me and to my colleagues about today is what are some of the, how does some of the physio physiologic changes that are caused by pregnancy actually um, change our cardiac function and, and output? And how do we uh, pay attention to that a little better? So that's a great question. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen with you again to show you a few more slides here. So the normal hemodynamics of pregnancy are wonderful for a baby, but they're very, very challenging for a mom. And, um, and frankly, this is why I've said for a million years, we are meant to have babies between the ages of 17 and 25. Um, and it's because you need a young body to accommodate these things. As you get older and your vascular system becomes less forgiving, you can't do the things that you need to do. So first we've got volume related changes. Plasma volume expands peaking around 28 to 34 weeks. Um, in addition to the plasma volume, there's a lesser increase in red cell vo volume leading to you know, that sort of anemia of pregnancy, the reduced hemoglobin reduced hematocrit levels that we see with pregnancy. Um, we also, there's an increase in total sodium in the body by about a thousand milliequivalents and an increase in water, six to eight liters. Total gain in plasma volume is about 30 to 50% above the non-pregnant state. And um, as we all know, the absence of a relative anemia is associated with poor outcomes. And that may be due to high blood viscosity. 
in addition to the volume related changes, there are hemodynamic changes that are equally as important. Cardiac output raises to about 30 to 50% above baseline preload increases, which means the circulating blood volume increases, the amount going into the heart increases. Afterload, which is the resistance against which the heart has to pump, the systemic vascular resistance, goes down. Usually as a cardiologist, that's my favorite thing to see because it generally means that the heart has to work less hard. Um, but we'll come back to this when we talk about specific conditions. Also, the maternal heart rate increases by about 15 to 20 beats per minute. Um, if you add a COVID infection, prior COVID infection on top of that, by the way, add another 15 to 20 beats a minute. One of the most common consults I see these days are sinus tachycardia. And it's frequently somebody who had COVID a couple of months ago, and now she's pregnant and her heart rate's 120. Um, so we do see that increase in heart rate, and some of that is physiologic. Vascular resistance, so afterload, Systolic blood pressure falls early in gestation, and then it should gradually increase through the third trimester, although we know that sometimes that increase is not so gradual. Um, SVR goes down. And the mechanisms for these changes. So this is what's important here. I know that I, you guys as OBs are probably about to like tune out, but stay with me here for two more sentences. Increased endothelial prostacyclin, enhanced nitric oxide production, and increased aortic compliance. Those are things that I'm sure that you heard in medical school um, and that you thought you were never going to have to remember again. But one of the most important things to understand is you have to have a healthy vasculature in order to have a healthy pregnancy. Um, if we look at vascular modification, so the, the vessels, like everything else in pregnancy, the ligaments, the joints, everything's got to become more compliant. The vessels also have to become more compliant. Uterine artery blood flow makes up 12% of the total cardiac output. So if I can't augment my cardiac output, I can't grow a healthy baby. And then there's hypercoagulability, right? We've got increased clotting factor levels, protein C, protein S resistance, um, that can also change what's happening in the vasculature. So here is um, just an up-to-date look at how the hemodynamics change in a normal pregnancy. And so you see that the cardiac output goes up at before eight weeks, we start to see that dramatic increase. So I'm not talking about an advanced pregnancy. I'm talking about early pregnancy and that cardiac output starts to go up. It levels out surprisingly about week 16. So I don't need to be able to augment my cardiac output considerably to get from 16 to 40. If I can get to where I need to be by 16 weeks, then I will generally do okay. Mean blood pressure slowly drifts up. And SVR initially takes a significant drop and then sort of turns around and planes out. By the way, this SVR drop, you know, all your patients who get weak and dizzy and hot and nauseated and they have to lie down and put their feet up and sometimes they pass out. That's right here. That's this group of patients right here that don't tolerate that drop in SVR. If we look at labor and delivery, um, obviously labor and delivery is associated with tremendous hemodynamic changes, right? Anxiety, exertion, pain, contractions, involution, bleeding. The cardiac output increases by 15% early in labor and 25% in the active phase of labor, okay? So that when you start pushing, you've already increased your cardiac output 50% with the pregnancy, and then I'm asking you for another 25% to push this baby out. Immediately postpartum, cardiac output increases to 80% above the pre-labor values because of autotransfusion from the placenta. So one thing that I frequently see is that baby comes out, everybody high fives each other, woohoo, great job, we did it, and mom's dying. And so that immediate postpartum period is when it's absolutely most important for us to pay attention to our moms. And so if we look at the hemodynamics of pregnancy and how they increase the risk of future cardiovascular events. We're stressing the maternal carbohydrate, lipid, and inflammatory pathways, as well as vascular function. We are uncovering underlying metabolic and vascular disease. Preeclampsia and pregnancy-induced hypertension may also cause damage to the vascular endothelium. They are both caused by a damaged vascular endothelium, and they cause additional damage to the vascular endothelium. 
And then um, hypertension, preeclampsia triggers inflammatory and autoimmune responses. And interestingly, pregnancy loss may be indicative of an underlying inflammatory, thrombotic, or vascular disorder. So the most important question here, how should pregnancy, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, maternal placental syndromes, pregnancy complications, what does that mean for women's cardiovascular risk? And those are really the questions that we are trying to answer. And so that's it. Wow. So that was really a great walk through the physiologic changes of pregnancy that we all kind of stopped paying attention to in medical school. <laughs> so that's very important. But one thing you did say that that rang true with me is that you have to have a healthy vasculature to have a healthy pregnancy. And I think that's where we run into a lot of issues um, on the OB side is that we may be having people who have medical comorbidities already. So when patients already have some underlying comorbidities um, or if they've had some history, which patients should we be recommending for baseline cardiac workup? We've been hearing more and more about this from our maternal fetal medicine specialists, and it seems like everybody pretty much needs a baseline cardiac workup. So how do you kind of, what guidance do you have for us to define who we should be really paying close attention to? First, I'll say that's not a bad idea, really. Um, and probably when I give you this list that I'm about to show you, you're going to see that it encompasses most of the patients you see. I need to see your patients with advanced maternal age. Yes, those, those elderly 35-year-olds that come hobbling in from the nursing home on their canes. I need to see them. <laughs> um, Okay, El we're elderly, prima gravitas. Um, patients with hypertension. If they have underlying hypertension, they already have vascular dysfunction. We're already starting behind the eight ball. Even if they're on a very small dose of an antihypertensive, um, those people are, are already behind the eight ball. They're at higher risk for maternal placental syndromes. They're at higher risk for preeclampsia. If you've had a prior maternal placental syndrome, so if you had preeclampsia in one pregnancy and you are considering a second pregnancy, I would be more than happy to see your patients. I'm happy to counsel them. We talk about the risk of recurrence, the importance of aspirin, um, the importance of blood pressure monitoring. So all of my patients um, with any hypertensive disorders or risk for hypertensive disorders are given a blood pressure cuff to take home. They're given a log and I want to know those blood pressures. And if I haven't heard from you in a week or two, I'll find you. Um, Anybody with known coronary disease or cerebrovascular disease. And believe it or not, we're seeing more of these folks. I had a heart attack when I was 32 and now I'm 40 and I'd like to have a baby. Or I had a stroke when I was 27 and now I wanna have a baby. And then of course, known congenital heart disease. Um, and those people, the congenitals are frequently better managed in tertiary centers. I do send some of my congenitals to Emory um, just because they've got a very robust adult congenital program. And I'm not talking about the straightforward ones, but the complex congenitals um, are too much for us to handle in the north side system. And then anybody you're worried about, anybody that makes you uncomfortable. Um, I frequently see women who are obese, for example, very high BMI um, because people are concerned. And, and I don't mind seeing anybody. And I think most of us in cardio obstetrics think that, you know, an ounce of prevention is, is the way to go. And so we, um, we're happy to see just about any of those patients. I think we've all had those patients that we're really concerned about when they become pregnant, um, you know, particularly in the obstetrics world and sometimes even in the emergency departments where pregnancy is often diagnosed, we kind of get that sinking feeling in our gut, like, oh no, she's pregnant. And that's the person. So I've sent a lot of people for cardiac um, evaluation just because we are uh, more of an outlying center. We're not in the heart of Atlanta. We don't necessarily always have access to every resource that we want. And we've actually uncovered a lot of cardiac pathology um, here at our, you know, in West Georgia. So I, I do agree with that. And we have some great cardiologists here who have been willing to work with us and see some of our patients. Um, but those more complex patients may, you know, want to have a cardio obstetrics con um, consult. Now, we are talking a little bit about preconception counseling, but what about that person who shows up that's 28 weeks, who is already pregnant and we maybe see her in the emergency department 
And we know that this is going to be a problem. Blood pressures are high. Um, she may have obesity. She may have underlying chronic hypertension. How do we manage those folks? Well, those guys are my favorite because, um, you know, they don't listen. But so I'm going to just give you a couple more words, if that's okay, on preconception counseling, because I realized that I got excited and cut myself off early. Um, so okay. just give you a couple of the tools that we use for the purpose of preconception counseling. Um, you know, the biggest thing about preconception counseling is it takes place preconception, right? And um, as you just alluded to, we don't always get to see people preconception, but um, preparation is everything. So we like to identify, um, we take a good history, a good auscultative exam. We will generally perform a baseline EKG as well as an echocardiogram um, for the cardiologists out there no bubble studies and no definity in your pregnant women, please. Um, and that's not an absolute and the risk is probably minimal, but as somebody who deals with cardio obstetrics on the regular, you don't want a baby to come up with a second thumb and all of a sudden it's because you gave them definity or did a bubble study during their echo. Um, so skip those because they're not really necessary most of the time at that point. Um, we do Holter monitors, event monitors, CT scans. Yes, I do CT scans in pregnancy. It is okay. Um, MRIs as indicated. The tools that we use, there are three main tools, okay? There's CARPREG, which was sort of the initial tool that we had, and it looked at cardiac disease in pregnancy and how to assess risk. What do I tell patients? And there were four predictors that they used. Did you have a cardiac event? Do you have heart failure or are you blue? Do you have obstruction of your left heart, either with a valve, with hokum, et cetera? And do you have a low EF? And the risk that it gave you was based upon this scoring system. Now, most of us didn't think this was complete enough. It was a good place to start, but we felt like it was incomplete. So next came the Zahara score. The Zahara score took a few more things into account and gave us a weighted risk, okay? And some people still use this, it's a good scoring system. But once again, um, with all of the congenital heart disease out there, I don't think it's complete. So this is what I use. It's the World Health Organization Cardiovascular Disease and Pregnancy Risk Assessment, okay? And it looks at everything, including PACs and PVCs, right? So I mean, everything from just about nothing to something that could be something. So mild or uncomplicated here, okay? Mild or uncomplicated has a 2.5 to 5% pregnancy related risk, which is really only slightly more than what we would expect, okay? And these are like the mitral valve prolapse, um, the repaired ASDs that were patched in childhood, um, the VSDs that were allowed to close spontaneously. World Health Support, um, World Health Organization Class 2, unrepaired VSDs and ASDs, repaired tetralogy of Fallot, Turner syndrome, even without aortic root dilatation, Turner syndrome is a cardiac risk factor, um, and most arrhythmias besides the PACs and PVCs. So this is where your AFibs and your SVTs are going to fall. Hmm. Okay. Two to three, 10 to 19% risk. This is a mildly depressed LVEF. So this is... Um, you know, and 45 ain't bad. I see a lot of EFs of 45%. And people don't really think of the significant risk, but there is a significant risk associated with even a very mildly impaired LBEF. Hocums, um, bicuspid aortic valves, Marfans, and most of the time we worry about the aorta in our Turners, our Marfans, our Ehlers, Danlos, our Lloyd Dietz. Um, the aorta is our biggest concern in those. Repaired coarctations and AV septal defects. Class three, um, and now we're getting into things that are sort of, you know, beyond what you guys would generally deal with. But the one I'd like you to see here, peripartum cardiomyopathy with a normal LVEF. So this is a peripartum who has completely recovered off of meds. And they still fall into this 19 to 27% um, chance of significant morbidity or mortality. Okay, so recovered peripartums, that is a problem. Um, and then class four. And class four, these are the people that we recommend termination for. And so that's sort of what we do. 
Um, preconception counseling is wonderful, but there are two limitations. It has to happen preconception and patients do whatever they want to do, regardless of what you say. Um, but it is critical that we document in painful detail what we have told these people, because you guys work in the most litigious specialty there is. And so you know that people don't hear what you say, or they hear what you say at the time, but maybe they forget it, or it disappears, or it goes out of their minds. I document from head to toe. I told Mrs. Smith that her risk associated with pregnancy of significant morbidity mortality was 10 to 19%. She desires to continue this pregnancy. I will care for her to the best of my ability throughout the pregnancy with the knowledge that she is at increased risk. Um, and so that's really what I do. Um, I just document the heck out of everything. I, I totally agree. I think that, you know, using the who, who classification is helpful, even for someone like me, where some of these terms are, are like Greek, but I think that it's important for, for us to, to know that and to talk about that with our patients. And many times, most of our patients are not interested in termination. Like I've had three patients with cardiac disease this year, and we've seen some at our hospital. Um, and it, it's really kind of a matter of making sure they understand the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, and then documenting that we have had that conversation and what their risk actually is. I will also say too, that I do not pull punches. Um, so first off, for people who are starting off in cardioobstetrics, the World Health Organization gives you tremendous guidance. And that is where I would start your journey when it comes to evaluating people preconception or even postconception. I still give them the same risks. Um, obviously, the options for termination are getting somewhat limited um, in the current day and age, but I am not afraid to tell somebody that I truly believe that it is in their best interest and the best interest of their baby to terminate the pregnancy. I've guided four patients um, through terminations in the last 10 years or so. And it's been painful and awful, but they're alive. Um, and there are some cardiac conditions that are absolutely not compatible with pregnancy. And when I run into those cardiac conditions, I'm very, very honest and it hurts them. And I know that it hurts them. Um, but generally I can convince them that having an alive mom is better than having a dead mom. Right, right, absolutely. I want to switch gears just a little bit to cover a very um, common condition that we see here. We see a ton of preeclampsia here in West Georgia. And um, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts about when should we get that? Well, we already know that if people have had past preeclampsia, we're going to get that cardiac workup. But for those people who are prevent presenting who might be at increased risk of preeclampsia, like maybe it's their first baby, they're younger than 20, over 40, you know, that sort of thing. How does preeclampsia, um, the, how does the cardi, how can cardiology help us through that preeclamptic period, whether they've just been diagnosed with preeclampsia or if they're at risk, like what sorts of things should we make sure we're screening these patients for? So the easy thing that we can help you with is the management of the blood pressure. Um, you know, and not that you guys don't do a great job, but you have a lot of other fish to fry during pregnancy. And also, and I, I'll say it, right? You guys also have a bundled DRG. You're trying to see a lot of people. You're trying to serve a population that generally exceeds your capacity. And so I understand that it can be really difficult for you guys to, and when I say manage blood pressure, I'm talking about like, I have an MA who calls people every other day who says, what is your blood pressure? What is your blood pressure? Did you take your medicines? We call pharmacies to make sure that people pick up their medicines. And I've been known to set an alarm and text the patient every night and say, time for your nifedipine. Thank you. Um, so we have, you know, resources in place that allow us to, to provide that level of care. The interesting thing that I want to tell you about preeclampsia, and this is the hill that I will die on. I just want you to know that. Um, I, I want to share with you some, some statistics about preeclampsia. And so okay. I'm back to sharing my screen preeclampsia is cardiovascular disease. It is every single time. So I'm going to show you some data. Um, 600,000 women they looked at. If you had preeclampsia, just preeclampsia, 
you had a 1.2 fold higher risk of death long term, okay, out 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. If you wow. had preeclampsia and a preterm delivery, you were 2.7 times more likely to die. If you had preeclampsia and a preterm delivery, you were eight times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease. Mm. And of course, the long-term risk of death was no higher among fathers. It was only the mothers. So this is a one-sided issue. This is related to mom's body. So if you look here, this is the Kaplan-Meier curves. Red, no preeclampsia, and your baby came on time. Light blue, preeclampsia, but your baby came on time. They're pretty close to one another, right? That's that 1.2. No preeclampsia, but your baby came early. Look at this. Oh, and wow. And this is up to 25 years. Okay. So if you had preeclampsia and a preterm delivery, you were this orange curve. And watch these curves diverge. This is not mortality related to index event. Right. Watch them separate. And you can see we do have a little bit of early mortality here in the orange line. But watch this. It just keeps going down, down, down. Scottish evaluation of 130,000 deliveries. And they looked at the risk of what they call ischemic heart disease, admission or death. That was it. If you came in with an ischemic, ischemic heart disease or if you died of ischemic heart disease. If you had a low birth weight baby, that's it. You were 1.9 time, times more likely to have an admission or death from ischemia just because your baby was small. Your baby was small because your vasculature didn't work. If you had a preterm delivery, 1.8 times. If you had preeclampsia, twice as likely. If you had all three characteristics, small baby, preterm delivery, preeclampsia, you were seven times more likely to get admitted or to die from ischemic heart disease. And there are data like this everywhere. I could show you another 50 studies, but I won't. This one is the one that really proved it for me. It's a longitudinal study. It looked at 44,000 babies, okay? And all it looked at was how much the baby weighed and whether or not their mom lived or died. That was the only question in the study, okay? And 3,500 was sort of their cutoff for normal. 3,500 gram baby, okay? You had a 3,500 gram baby. Your death from all causes and from cardiovascular disease was one your relative risk. If you had a 2,500 to 3,499 gram baby, I had a baby in that category. Anybody else on here have a baby in that category? I don't know, bet you did. Look at this, 1.27 times more likely to die from cardiac or from all causes, 1.96 times more likely to die from cardiac causes. You can't grow a big fat baby. Your vasculature is not what it should be. If your baby was less than 2,500 grams, you were seven times more likely to die from cardiovascular causes. And wow. each thousand gram drop, your risk went up 2.2 times. Wow. So even the AHA actually has incorporated pregnancy-related risk into their risk of cardiovascular disease in women, such that if you had preeclampsia, diabetes, or pregnancy-related hypertension, you are automatically in an intermediate risk category for cardiovascular disease, even if you're 25 years old. And look what we're keeping company with here. We're keeping company with poor exercise capacity, metabolic syndrome, family history, obesity, cholesterol of greater than 200, high blood pressure. Look at the company we're keeping. This is not a small risk factor. This is a significant risk factor and it ups your 10 year predicted risk to the 10 to 20% level. And so the inability to form a healthy placental attachment, a fat baby and maintain your own blood pressure reflects poor cardiovascular health. Pregnancy is the earliest stress test and women are failing everywhere. We've got time, we have the opportunity to treat these women and to decrease their risk, but we have to appreciate the connection. 
Wow. And I, I would say that, um, you know, practice over the last 10 years has made a believer out of me. Like many of these conditions that we do see are based on the fact that the vasculature is just not responding in the way that it should be. Um, when we look at that, when we saw the data and we looked at uh, cardiac disease and cardiomyopathy in Georgia, particularly the department of public health has stratified out cardiomyopathy from the other cardiac diseases, because we see it so often. And I often see it related to preeclampsia um, as well. So there's definitely a connection there. Oh, absolutely. We're seeing folks in our ER that come back after having their baby a few weeks ago, maybe even with preeclampsia, but also with shortness of breath and some pulmonary edema and that sort of thing. So um, recent, probably in the last year or so, I started adding the BNP to my preeclampsia labs. What, what would be your guidance there? What are some of the warning signs we can look out for for cardiomyopathy? Like how can we kind of just have that as a high index of suspic suspicion? So to start off, I truly and honestly believe that preeclampsia, preeclampsia with volume overload and peripartum cardiomyopathy are on one continuum, right? You see your preeclamptics and they come in with high blood pressure, but, and maybe their feet are a little swollen, but they're not in pulmonary edema. And then we see that subset that comes in in pulmonary edema. And I look at them and I say, gosh, I'm not sure if your ejection fraction is going to be normal or not. And it's really only the echo that tells me, is this pure preeclampsia or is this cardiomyopathy? And then we see the peripartum cardiomyopathies. And I truly believe that that is one road um, with different stops. And I think that the next few years are going to really point that out to all of us. Um, peripartum cardiomyopathy is sort of the bane of the cardiologist's existence. It's truly the worst thing that we can see. Um, it has a lot of different components, I think, risks. Um, we see it very frequently here. Peripartum cardiomyopathy is more common in black patients. It's more common um, in patients from certain regions. So that if you look at pockets in Haiti or Zaire, you will find that peripartum cardiomyopathy happens in one in a hundred women who give birth. On the flip side, if you look at Asian women, it's more like one in 500,000. So there's something genetic that plays a role in peripartum cardiomyopathy. If we define PPCM, it's heart failure, which develops um, after 20 weeks. And that's kind of an issue of debate. Some people say it has to be the last month. I think after 20 weeks is more than adequate or within five to six months of delivery. We have talked about taking that out to a year on some of the councils that I'm on. I think that in the near future, we're gonna end up stretching that out. Injection fraction less than 45% and no other cause of heart failure can be found. So as I was alluding to, the incidence varies very widely based upon ethnic, racial and regional differences. One in 100 pregnancies in Nigeria, one in 300 in Haiti. So that if I see a Haitian woman who comes in with volume overload and symptoms of preeclampsia, I'm more concerned about her EF than I am a Caucasian woman who might come in in the same situation. Um, incidence is much lower in Caucasian populations, about one in 1500 in Germany, one in 10,000 in Denmark, who knows why, right? Germany and Denmark are not that far apart. Um, the lowest risk is probably in Asian patients, one in 20,000 in one Japanese study. Um, although there are small pockets in Asia, as I said, that it's unheard of, one in about 500,000. Overall in the U.S., it's about one in 1,000 to one in 4,000, depending on where you are. Predisposing factors, multips, multiple gestations, family history, being Black, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, malnutrition, age, prolonged use of tocolytics, and low selenium levels. Now you might look at a lot of those things and go back to what I said before, which is I think this is on a continuum with preeclampsia because those are the risk factors that we look at for preeclampsia. I also would add obesity to this list. It's one of our more newly established risk factors, and it still hasn't officially made the list, um, but I believe that it will in the near future. 
And I always stress um, a lot of the times to patients, particularly just because you have obesity doesn't mean that you are not malnourished. And so you right. can see a lot of malnutrition in obesity as well. I think that's Absolutely. an important point. So the pathology, right? We said cardiac output has to increase. Stroke volume has to increase. If you can't do that, you can't maintain a healthy pregnancy. Um, myocarditis may play a role. There have been viral genomes that have been um, actually identified in peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, I think with COVID, we're going to have more information on that because COVID really um, affected the heart quite significantly. And so that should tell us more. Um, toxic horm hormonal environments, prolactin levels. Um, so the suppression of prolactin is one of the ways that we treat cardiogenic shock and peripartum cardiomyopathy. There are also genetic factors because of familial clusters. Um, so if mom had peripartum cardiomyopathy, that should sort of, you know, make your ears sort of perk up. Um, a pro-inflammatory state and then autoimmune levels. And um, so these are all things that we think play a role. Most patients are diagnosed in the first month postpartum. And I don't think that's because that's when we find it. I think that's because the baby's gone now and all the shortness of breath and the swelling and the orthopnea and the things that we were attributing to pregnancy are now no longer attributable to pregnancy. Delays in diagnosis come from under recognition and also from symptom overlap. But those delays are associated with an increased risk of complications and poorer outcomes. I can tell you that with the exception of one particularly prickly Medicaid insurance company, I, I've never had a problem getting an echo approved for a pregnant woman. It's an easy test, it's no risk, and, um, and I would advocate that we use them more. So symptoms, fatigue, palpitations, peeing at night, orthopnea, edema, orthostasis, syncope, and cough. We see that in pregnancy over and over and over again, right? And it's very, very difficult sometimes to really say, yes, this is normal in pregnancy versus no, it's not. And I, I struggle with that every day. Um, and I err on the side of caution. I will tell you that I probably echo 95% of the consults that I see because it's straightforward. It gives me a ton of information and I don't want to miss this. Signs, EKG changes an enlarged cardiac silhouette, arrhythmias, tachycardia, pleural effusions, pulmonary edema, and then of course, cardiogenic shock. Differential diagnosis, late preeclampsia, right? We know that now our preeclamptics about 10% are showing up postpartum. Um, hypertensive disease of pregnancy, myocardial infarction, um, spontaneous coronary dissection, pulmonary embolism, amniotic fluid embolism. So lots of conditions that can be very difficult to differentiate. Wow. And so I, you know, have been looking at this for quite some time because the Georgia Perinatal Quality Collaborative has been working on this and, and working on some resource guides. So sometimes I do feel a little like I'm doing way too much, but it makes, you know, I'm going to get that echo. I want to get, you know, all of these things. And, and so just based on what you shared, that makes me feel a lot better. Like I'm not overkilling it, but you know, oh, you can't pay out. companies pay about $400 for an echo. So when you are talking about allocation of resources and finances, order the echo. Okay, good. I can keep doing that. So um, we're getting close to our time here and I wanna make sure we have time for questions, but I wanted to ask just a quick question about congenital heart disease. I saw a patient yesterday who, you know, some of, some of the folks with these interesting congenital heart diseases are living now to childbearing age. So we kind of have to be ready for those folks too who come in and say, oh, well, I had a repair of my tetralogy of below or whatever, and now I wanna get pregnant. So um, any guidance you can give us there? Sure. And for that, I would say we go right back here to the World Health Organization risk assessment. Um, and it talks about all of the specific 
lesions and repairs. Um, you're lucky if somebody came in and told you that they were a repaired tech, because most of the time they come in and tell me, I had some kind of surgery when I was three, but I don't know what it was. And it was done in Arkansas and I have no records. <laughs> and then we're right. trying to back it down. Um, but you know, these patients are very complicated. And really I would encourage you, and I do the same thing myself, I would refer these patients to an adult congenital center um, for their cardiac care. And the adult congenital center at Emory, and hey, I don't work for Emory anymore. I used to a long time ago, um, but it's a fantastic place. They will work very closely with you. They will see your patient and they will stay in communication with you. Because I think that in community hospitals, like we're all in, there are some things that just exceed our abilities. And so, you know, you send them to the Emory Congenital Clinic and maybe Emory says, hey, you know what, you'll be okay. Just do this, get an echo here, have her come and see us and she can go ahead and deliver with you. Or they may say, you know what, she's got a high risk of circulatory collapse, the need for ECMO, the need for mechanical circulatory support. And then maybe you refer to a tertiary center, maybe you refer to Emory, or maybe you refer to, you know, your own tertiary center. But wherever you go, you want to find people who are comfortable taking care of congenital heart disease in adults. Um, also, I want to stress that there are a subset of patients who should be advised to terminate. And that's down here, pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, LVEF less than 30, New York Heart Association class three or four, peripartums with residual left ventricular dysfunction, severe mitral aortic stenosis, a systemic right ventricle. So that means that the right ventricle is essentially doing the work for the whole body. Those would be like transpositions um, and um, other repairs, single right ventricle, hypoplastic left hearts, et cetera. And then Marfans or bicuspids with enlarged aortic roots, severe native co that hasn't been fixed, a Fontan who's got a complication, or vascular Ehlers-Danlos. Um, and the European society says it much more strongly because they always do. Um, those people should be counseled toward termination. They don't always choose it, but we should at least give them that option. And whatever we have to do to fight the madness in the Georgia legislature that allows us to get them a termination, we'll, we have to do. Well, wow. This has been so helpful for me. I've got a whole page full of notes. And, you know, the last question I had for you is, in your opinion, what are some of the, just the low-hanging fruit, the practical ways that we can decrease maternal mortality due to cardiac disease? We've been looking, you know, at, at our own data um, with Wellstar and just kind of starting to really pay close attention to these patients. But what are some practical tips that you give to folks who consult with you about how to kind of recognize these things, make sure we're ringing the alarm bells early, getting these patients the help they need? So I think you need a multidisciplinary approach. We have um, a maternal mortality committee in the Northside system. We run it um, as a giant committee and then separately in all of our hospitals. Any patient who is deemed high risk by their OB um, is brought to the committee. The committee involves cardiology, OB, MFM, NICU, um, and anesthesia. And then we bring in other specialties as needed. We come up with a comprehensive delivery plan for these folks. Um, so that frequently I'll say, um, I want vaginal delivery, which always surprises everybody because everybody's like, no, C-section safer. It's not, by the way. There are very, very few cases that I recommend C-section. Um, I will generally recommend the vaginal delivery. I will sometimes recommend that they're allowed to labor down with an assisted second stage. We have an anesthesia plan that says, yes, she's okay for an epidural. Epidural is going to be our plan. Um, the NICU is on board. We say, okay, we're shooting for a delivery around 36 to 37 weeks, but the plan goes into the chart very early. Um, and that's because babies apparently are not much for plans and uh, they turn up whenever they want to. And so if this patient comes in at 3 a.m. and your laborist is on call or your partner's on call, I need everybody on the same page. So we put the phone numbers for all the players on there. You can reach me at three o'clock in the morning if you need to. And we've got a plan. Um, and I think that collaboration, I think that the cocoon model is huge. We have to 
surround these women in safety. We have to let them know that their health and their baby's health is our number one concern. And then we have to follow through with all of the things that we say that we're going to do. And so I think that's really the best way to handle it. I think that I would encourage every hospital to develop a similar committee, to have those resources in place, and to make that living document. It, you can, it can go in Epic or Cerner or whatever your EMER is. And when Mrs. Smith comes in at three o'clock in the morning ruptured, somebody pulls it up and says, oh, look, they already know that she's got X, Y, and Z. They've already talked about it. They've decided that this is the best thing. We'll go forward with the plan. I completely agree. I think that this has been so helpful. I hope that those folks who have joined us found it helpful as well. And I want to leave a few minutes open to questions. You can either type your questions in the chat or unmute yourself and just go ahead and jump in with your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, I just have a comment, not necessarily a question. I, I, I just appreciate this whole um, talk. I learned so much. And what was um, surprising or shocking to me was you mentioned the ideal age for childbirth would be between 17 and 25. Um, and in our cultures has shifted because think about my situation, me and my wife have four kids and all of which was done uh, after she was 25. So I guess in a sense, she was, she was high risk. So I just see this complications may arise as people are having babies, you know, much older than 25. So hopefully we can all get on board with doing things and making <laughs> interventions earlier to prevent risk because like you said, a lot of patients are going to do what they want to do and uh, we can't stop them. But I didn't know 17 to 25. Anatomically, that's when the body's made for ideal reproduction. Obviously, as a society, and I, I tell my daughters the same thing, right? Get your butt through school. Make sure that you've established yourself. Make sure you are on solid footing before you have a baby. Unfortunately, for a lot of women, that doesn't happen until after 35, and then we also have an emphasis on find the right partner, um, right? And so that pushes it even later. And, and so we have to sort of balance this physiologic versus societal expectation. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, anyone else have any questions for Dr. Volt? I have uh, two questions. Um, thank you again for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, the first one is just a curiosity. Um, and when you showed the depreciation curves um, following prematurity, uh, what is the impact um, on an elderly gravid who is using a frozen or a younger egg? Does that make any difference on those outcomes? It doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, it has to do with the mom forming the placenta. So okay. it really, and, and you know, we don't have a ton of data on that yet. Um, it's all being looked at, but it really seems to be that placental interaction. And so that's what we know thus far, although it's a very interesting question and there's certainly people looking into it. Um, my, thinking my second question, uh, and you did touch on this, but for a small center as um, Dr. Baker has, has described you as ours, how, how do we best uh, make the decision who should be delivering at tertiary care? Is that MFM or is that the panel or... Um, cause that's, that's one of the difficult decisions we have, particularly with the tertiary care centers being quite far from our centers. So women are pretty resistant to, to, to going away if they don't have to. Sure. And that's a challenging question. Um, I, I will usually, when I see the patient, I'll make a recommendation. I make a recommendation on the mode of delivery, the timing of delivery, the location of delivery. I will say that for most people, they can deliver near home, um, the people that I worry about the most are sort of that WHO category three, um, certainly category four. I like to have those people delivered in a tertiary center. Um, I also think that if you're uncomfortable, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's you. And if you say, you know what, I don't think this is safe, then you get your patient out of there. Also, um, we have in the Northside system worked very hard on, um, and we're in the middle of this, developing a network that allows for quick transfer. Because for us, 
um, our highest level NICU is at Atlanta, but our highest cardiology delivery of services is Equinet. And so we're working to form a seamless transfer process. We, for example, had a patient who had a massive postpartum hemorrhage, ended up getting over a hundred units of blood product. She, um, she was transferred to me and I put her on ECMO. She stayed on ECMO for three days as she got through the transfusion lung injury. We were able to get her off ECMO. We brought the baby over um, once she was cleared by Atlanta and, and everybody did okay. But if we didn't have that transfer process in place where we could immediately get people to where we need to be. And then also you've got to have people on both ends who have the knowledge to understand what you can and can't do. Um, a lot of these women we can save with higher level cardiology interventions, but for reasons that I don't understand, people tend to be very resistant to that. Yeah, thank you very much. That's something, uh, Dr. Baker, we can work on as far as the, the transfer efficiency is something we sometimes have a hard time with, isn't it, Doug? <clears throat> Absolutely. We've had patients here with, you know, all sorts of cardiac lesions and just getting them to where they need to go. So we're glad to be friends with you, Dr. Boltzmann. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to help, and we have a very active ECMO program, as I know you guys do in the Wellstar system as well, um, and we have found that we, if we can help these women live a couple of days, we can usually get them through just about anything. We've done it with COVID. We've done it with hemorrhage. We've done it with um, other pneumonias and infections. So we've really had very good luck. And there's a lot of resistance sometimes to using these therapies in these women, which I don't understand. Um, but we actually, believe it or not, um, our postpartum that we put on ECMO, we had our ECMO nurses. It was her last baby. She lost her uterus as part of the hemorrhage. Um, it was her first and last living child. And her overwhelming desire was to breastfeed. And so I had my ECMO nurses with a symphony pump pumping her breasts every three hours while she was knocked out on ECMO. Um, but we were able to get her milk to come in and she was able to exclusively breastfeed the baby when she left, which was really wow. amazing. So I think that, um, you know, we just, we try to take care of all aspects of mom. We have time for one last question. Um, Dr. Reynolds asks, when initiating antihypertensives in gestational hypertension or converting a chronic hypertensive from a teratogenic antihypertensive, is there a protocol for choosing the appropriate med, i.e. labetalol, nifedipine, or aldamate? So there's no real protocol. Um, most people start with labetalol because it's been around the longest. It tends to be the best tolerated, um, but it also doesn't work very well. And so I will frequently put people on a couple hundred BID. I never start a hundred BID of labetalol because I've never seen anybody therapeutic on a hundred BID of labetalol. I will put people on a couple hundred BID of labetalol. I will give them a couple of days because that's really all it takes. And then I usually add nifedipine. I do it in an additive fashion. Um, Aldamed is a great drug, but it is almost impossible to find. So um, I will usually do what I can do. Um, then my third line is actually Coreg, Carbetalol. It's a beta blocker. Um, and so I will add that one on top. I, you know, there's some question, does it cross the, the placenta? Does it cause fetal bradycardia? My experience has been that the beta blockers are generally very well tolerated, particularly the cardioselective beta blockers. If I have them on very high doses, I will watch the fetus's growth because there is sort of a theoretical risk of growth restriction. Um, but otherwise, I think people generally do very well. With regard to nifedipine, I start with 30 milligrams at bedtime. I tell them they're gonna get a headache. Everybody gets a headache. If they stay on it for about five to seven days, about 90% of women can power through the headache and it will go away. They'll become accustomed to it. I tell them to have a cup of coffee if that's what you need to do to get through. Um, and then I, I increase from there. I go from 30 once a day to 30 twice a day, then 60 and 30, and then 60 and 60 is usually my max dose on that one. I find my pet, nifedipine is kind of my best friend um, when it comes to management of hypertension in pregnancy. Thank you so much. I know often we see February as Women's Heart Health Month but we often forget a really important population of, of women, and that is pregnant women. And we see the, 
the things that are happening in our state and across our country with regard to maternal cardiac health. So I think this was such a timely um, uh, conversation for us to be able to have. I thank you for answering all my questions. So now I feel like I can uh, have all these additional things to add to our practice. And um, I want to thank all of our participants for coming out. This session was recorded and I'll be providing a link in case you're like me and need to go back and um, kind of shift through all of that just really um, concentrated, wonderful information that we received today. We're so grateful for you uh, coming on, Dr. Volz, and we hope to have you back in the future as we work on establishing our own cardio OB. And I will um, tell you, I'm going to put in the chat, I'm adding it right now, um, my email address and my cell phone number. I am always happy to give you my two cents worth on a case if it helps at all. Um, I know the, the cardiology guys at Kennestone very well, trained with a lot of them. And if you need me to kick somebody in the behind over there, I, I'm happy to do that um, on your behalf. We love that. We love that. That's so helpful for her. us. Um, Just getting anything anything that, that I can do to, to help. You know, this is not an issue that's hospital versus hospital or region versus region. This is a global problem and we've all got to help each other get through this. And so, you know, if I can help you with an opinion, if you've got somebody, I'm over in Lawrenceville on the East side, but if you have somebody that you would like me to see, I'm more than happy to do that. And as I said before, um, the Emory Congenital Program is another fantastic resource. Thank you so much. This has been super helpful. And uh, I hope everybody continues to have a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you, Dr. Volz. Thank you so much. Very enlightening.